Today's reading is taken from 2 Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 7 to 18. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious Sorry, is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, good, good. Okay, uh, let's just have a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can gather here in this place this morning. And would you now just uh, be with us in your manifest presence? that you might give us ears to hear and understand and hearts that are soft and open to your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so the, uh, the title of uh, today's talk, uh, and this isn't the title that I chose, Pads chose it for me, but I think it's an interesting title, is uh, The Spirit Brings Freedom. And when I was thinking about giving this sermon, the first thing I wanted to really grapple with is what does freedom actually mean? Because it can mean different things to different people. And uh, I found myself thinking about this while I was at work, painting away, uh, as I do. And uh, I've come to some thoughts and some conclusions, which I think I, I'll share with you to begin with. So what is freedom? It's something that we all want. Uh, it's something that's fought for. It's prized above pretty much everything. And yet, the more I thought about it, the more I came to the conclusion, and I've got to be honest with you, is we can't be trusted with it. Because with freedom comes responsibility. And true freedom is the freedom that empowers an individual to do that which is right. And yet the reality is that in practice, when we have freedom, we generally use it to do that which is wrong. I'm sure you've heard of the saying, if you give someone enough rope, they'll hang themselves. Well, freedom is a little bit like that. And it was ever thus. Because right from the genesis of the world, this has been the case. Consider Adam and Eve in the garden. They had freedom to do whatever they wanted, to eat from any tree in the garden. There was an exception, and God knew what he was doing by providing that exception. Because he knew what people can do with too much freedom. We have the propensity to abuse it. 
So what is freedom? It's a fact that we can have the freedom to do whatever we want, whenever we want, and yet not be free. You could be in solitary confinement in a prison cell and yet still be freer than someone outside. Because freedom, true freedom, is a spiritual thing. It's a moral thing. It's freedom from the curse of sin and its effects. And this is what this passage is dealing with today. It's showing us that freedom is possible, but not through anything that we can do in our own strength or by our own efforts. You see, the law that was given by God to Moses was holy, was righteous, and yet, in the passage, it shows us that the very law that could have given life actually produced the exact opposite. Paul describes it as the ministry of death. It was given in glory, and yet Paul says that's exactly what it does. It brings death. Now, we're going to go to the, the Bible and look at some other scriptures that helps to clarify this point. If you've got a Bible, and I hope you have, <laughs> there's no condemnation here, honestly. Can you turn to Romans chapter 7? Because we're going to expand on this a little bit further through other writings of Paul's. In Romans chapter 7, verse 7, it says this. Paul writes, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. It's what I call the keep off the grass syndrome. You know that kind of thing where someone tells you not to do something and the moment you're told not to do that very thing, there's something inside of you that wants to do it, isn't there? Yeah? We've all been there. And it's what's referred to by the Bible as the sinful nature. The Bible says that we're all sinners. There's no one righteous. No, not one. No king, no queen, no priest, no pope. We're all sinners. Every single one of us. And we all need a saviour. We all need forgiveness. And that keep off the grass syndrome is something that's at work in us all the time. The moment we're told not to do something, as I said, it produces in us the very desire to do the exact opposite. You see, the thing is, this is the funny thing. Even though the law is holy and righteous, no one has ever been capable of keeping it. The Bible tells us in the book of James that if we break the law at one point, we've broken it all. That's every single one of us. Because we're all guilty of sin in some way, shape, or form. The law shows us that in actual fact, what we really need is a mediator. We need a go-between. We need a saviour. You see, God's standard of judgment is perfection. And there's no one in this room that's perfect. I'm not perfect. <laughs> no, I'm not perfect. And I know I need a saviour. I don't know if you know, but one of the things that I quite often do is street evangelism. And I have done right from the very time I first became a Christian 30 years ago. I'm a street preacher. I go to other towns. I speak to people about Jesus. And, you know, I, I found my own way of, of being able to communicate with people. I use tracks, etc., etc. 
And being a, 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 an evangelist is a bit like being a fisherman. And I don't know if you've ever listened to fishermen, but they will wax lyrical for hours on end about the tackle that they use and their preferred bait and the, their preferred methods of, of catching fish and all the rest of it. And all evangelists are a bit like that as well. We all have our preferred methods. And, uh, you know, speaking to people in the street can be a bit intimidating sometimes, uh, not just for the person you're speaking to, but for, for myself as well. But I, I sometimes use tracks, and the track that I really like is this one. It goes right to the very heart of the matter. It says, are you good enough to go to heaven? Okay? Now, you might think that people, once they're asked that question, would be very offended. But you would be wrong, because ex the exact opposite tends to be the case. Because there are no end of people that delight in telling me how good they are and how much they believe that they are good enough to go to heaven. And when they're quizzed on this, you generally find that people will say things like, well, uh, I've never murdered anybody. Uh, I've never uh, robbed a bank. Uh, I help old ladies across the road. I'm kind to people, etc., etc." This is quite often the case. But you see, the thing is, is once you start to explain to them that actually the Bible tells them that they're not good enough to go to heaven, and these passages explain why, it helps you to then explain to them the fact that they need a saviour. They need someone to be able to get them into heaven in the way that they can't do themselves. Let's go to another passage of scripture. Let's, this time we're going to go to Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. It says this, verse 11. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our conscience from the acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he who has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. You see, the first covenant showed us that we're sinful. The first covenant showed us that we're unable to keep the law. And yet, so often, we think that we can do this by the things that we do, by religious observance, by going to church, by ticking boxes, etc., etc. But we need a saviour. We need Jesus Christ. He's the one who is worthy. He's done what no one else has been able to do because he was able to keep the law perfectly. And he's filled on our behalf perfectly the righteous requirements of the law. The Bible says that he was tempted in every way and yet without sin. So he was the acceptable sacrifice that was made unto God. A sacrifice that that fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law. Because what we're talking about is righteousness. Righteousness apart from Christ is self-righteousness. And it's what most people possess. It's a righteousness that's of themselves. It's a righteousness where they think, like I used to think, that somehow there's a point system 
And if our good deeds outweigh our bad deeds, then somehow St. Peter might welcome us through the pearly gates. But the Bible tells us that that's not possible because we are utterly sinful. As I said, the Bible says that there's no one righteous. No, not one. But praise be to God, Jesus is righteous. So it's not through our own strength. It's not through our own efforts. It's through him. Because he's the one who suffered and died in our place. It's the blood of Jesus that sets us free from the power of sin and death. He's the one who's died and rose again, who, who ascended into heaven, is now seated at the right hand of God, who acts as a mediator between God and man. The Bible describes him as the second Adam, because through the first Adam all died, yet through the second Adam all have been made alive. For those who call on the name of the Lord, all can be saved. The second Adam has nullified the work of the first Adam. Through the first Adam, sin has come into the world. And so we've all been partakers of that sin nature. But Jesus, praise be to God, is not a partaker of that sin nature. He is the righteous one from the foundations of the earth. He's the righteous one. He's the one that kept the commandments perfectly. So that it's no longer a case of what we can do. It's a case of what he's done for us. We enter in on his tail. We enter in off the back of Jesus. So it's faith in Jesus that sets us free. It's not the law. It's not to say that the law is wrong because the commandment thou shalt not still still applies. The commandment thou shalt not murder still applies. But now there's a new law at work. It's the law of the Spirit. And where the Spirit is, there is freedom. The Spirit sets us free from the law of sin and death. Because we're now no longer slaves to the law, but we're slaves to Jesus Christ. And where there's liberty in Jesus, there's freedom. So my question is, is are you free? Are you free on the basis of the biblical meaning of freedom? Are you free spiritually? Are you free in your heart? Do you know that you're free? Because the Bible says that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. And again, that it was for freedom that Jesus set us free. It's God's desire that no man should perish, but that all should come to a saving knowledge of the truth and that we should all be free. He desires that none of us should be held captive by the law of sin and death. That's why Jesus died on the cross, to set us free. His perfect life for our imperfect one. What a wonderful saviour. What a wonderful saviour. That while we were still powerless, the Bible says, Christ died for the ungodly. He knows our situations. He knows the predicament that we're in. He knows the consequences of sin when it's full blown. And yet by his grace and through his love and his mercy, he laid down his own life so that we could be set free. So are you free? Well, if you're not free, and you know you're not free, then don't lose heart, because you can be free. You know, many years ago when I wasn't a Christian, I knew that I wasn't free. I knew I wasn't free. I knew that I was a captive. And I didn't know, I did not know how I could be set free. But there was something inside of me that yearned for that freedom. Because I knew that the lifestyle that I was living was destroying me and the people around me. I wanted to be free, but I didn't know how to be free until the night I first went to a church and heard someone tell me those things that I'm telling you people today. And it was on that night that I realized that freedom, even though it might seem illusionary, even though it might seem so near and yet so far, is so easy to obtain. Not by my own effort, but because of the love of someone who loved me long before I ever loved him. When I realized that Jesus, the Son of God, the one who created the heavens and the earth, loved me to the extent 
that he would die on the cross to set me free, I was faced with a choice. I had to accept that freedom. If someone offers you a gift, it's up to you whether you accept it or reject it. And that night I accepted it. How did I accept it? By simply asking Jesus to forgive my sin and to come into my life and to cleanse me and to wash me and to take me with him into heaven. And the night I confessed my sin and asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior, I found freedom. I found it. I found freedom. For the first time in my life, the following morning I woke up and realized that I was free. The Lord never did it for me. The Lord could never do it for me. No commandment keeping could ever do it for me. No amount of going to church and saying prayers could do it for me. But accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior did it for me just like that. Set me free. And I'm still free to this day. Not without sin, but free. Do you want to be free? Then accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Believe on him. Forget the nonsense of believing that you can do it on your own. Forget the nonsense of believing that being religious will curry any favor in the sight of God. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Believe on the name of Jesus and you will be set free. Amen. Thank you, Chris, um, so much. Isn't it good news that we have such a great Savior? Nothing in our past that cannot be forgiven when we put our trust in Jesus. So I'm, I just want to lead a prayer. Before Jane comes to lead our intercessions, I just want to lead a prayer that if you're someone sitting here this morning and you haven't yet invited Jesus into your heart, after what Chris has said, I, I could not move on without inviting you to pray this prayer along with me. So let's pray. If you want to invite Jesus into your heart this morning, just pray this with me silently in your heart as I pray. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for all the things that I've done wrong in my life. Please forgive me. Thank you that you died for me on the cross so that I could be forgiven and set free. Come into my life by your Holy Spirit, the freedom bringer. And set me free to live my life for you in eternity. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Thank you, Jane.